I have been working through our vision for the year. Our vision being from Isaiah chapter 60 and we receiving this word into our hearts, this theme, this God picture for 2022. It has to be God because it speaks against our circumstances in a supernatural way. It cannot be a natural perspective for 2022 uh, because it is only a supernatural truth. And I keep having supernatural encounters around this word. And I have the blessing to deliver to you the word for you today. A divine word for you today. God has so much love for you in the word that I have for you today. And so as we have started to look at Isaiah chapter 60, it is filled with so many promises that many people believe it could only exist after the return of Christ during the millennial reign because it is so jam-packed with blessing and favor. Yet it speaks of in its beginning a blessing over us in the midst of a cursed environment on the earth. It says literally darkness will cover the earth and thick darkness the people. Everybody say the earth. The earth. Everybody say the people. the people. Now, you live in the earth, but you are not the people. You are his bride. You are his church. You are his chosen. So when you hear the people, look outside and go, though is not us, that, that, that's another group. That's not me. Why? Because God declares his promise over you in the first few verses, which is what? Arise, shine, for your light, everybody say, my light, my light. has come. Your light, not Pastor Josh's light, not Mark Zuckerberg's light, not the inventor of whatever's light, your light, right? Receive that today over you. See that, that then it goes on to say, darkness covers the earth, thick darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you, right? And what will happen? His glory will be seen upon you. His glory will be seen upon you. Now, it does not say his glory will be seen by you. His glory will be seen by them upon you. It's very practical. By them upon you. How do we know they? Them in darkness. Them out there, see it on you. Why? Because it says this, the Gentiles shall come to your light. Now this passage of scripture is both practically to the Jew, to Israel, there's practical prophecy over Israel, and it's over the church, okay? It's for both. I don't have time to get too much into Israel today, but it's not one or the other, it, it, it is both, right? Because we can even receive it's for us with even more faith. Why? Because Isaiah chapter 59 speaks of what life is like far from righteousness, far from salvation, but God sees it, it declares it is not good, therefore he sends his right hand that in it we are sustained. Meaning the picture of Jesus took us far from salvation, far from righteousness and placed us in this covenant. We could say Isaiah 59 is a prophetic picture of the cross of Jesus, the life, the death, the resurrection to redeem us into this promise, okay? So look at this, the Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Meaning, they see glory on you. And it is not, you're so holy. It is, you have the light 
you have glory, I'm coming to you to find out what's happening. It's practical. It's practical. Why that's amazing is, you're here today, it means practical glory too. Practical light too, okay? Then we have lift up your eyes, verse four, all around and see. And we learned that that meant lift up your eyes and look around at what is going on again. It means see with the supernatural promise over the earth that is stuck in problems. Look again. So our word for this year was look again, meaning see yourself first, then see your circumstances second through the eyes of grace. Through the eyes of what Jesus has done for you and what Jesus declares over you. You can look in the natural and see darkness and thick darkness. And remember, we looked at thick darkness literally means chaos and confusion. And you can receive that you are the people or you can receive, I am the chosen. I am the second category, arise and shine. The one whose light has come the one whose God's glory is seen upon, okay? And the thing is, I have to carry on reading for today. Practically, when you look again, they all gather and they come to you, verse four. Your son shall come from afar and your daughter shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant and your heart shall swell with joy. Who's ready for a joyful year? Right? Right? Who's ready for joy instead of mourning? Because what? The abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. Right? And what's interesting is that is even more practical. It ties to the next line. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. Now here's the thing, I didn't really wanna preach this today because I feel like it's such a tricky subject. And so I was like, Lord, I'm not not preach this today. And so I was like, you know what? I just wanna enjoy the word. And I had a whole other sermon for today. And so I have been sensing God say to me, right, that there is going to be a transfer of wealth. And it's practical. It's not just heavenly wealth. I'm blessed in heaven, Lord, but I'm suffering on earth. It's practical. And I avoided this completely because I even know that people are gonna be in this, watching this today that think, wow, I didn't sign up for this. But I wanna tell you something, God wants you to walk in a divine favor this year that testifies of a divine heavenly father doing supernatural things that you cannot even fathom. And the thing is, when people came to Jesus about giving money, they said to Jesus, should we give money to the church? He did not say no. He said, do not forget love. Now, God wants you to know this year, more than any other year, a sense of how much he loves you. And I have been walking in divine financial favor without supernatural insight. I don't don't have any, I didn't get a Bitcoin trade tip. I didn't invest in GameStop. I have been walking in divine favor with Tara as a couple because we've been supernaturally 
open to sowing. And in COVID, I have never seen anything like it in my life. And so I'm walking in a blessing that I can't explain. Um, it's definitely not because we're, we're amazing, but I want to tell you something. I avoided preaching this today, and then on the way to church this morning, I saw a sermon from Pastor Joseph Prince, whose teachings have changed my life, um, and I saw it in, because in, I have his app, and uh, it's such a blessing, and, and we partner with that, and we, we're very excited that now the sermons are available for free, and uh, it's fantastic, and I want to encourage you to partner with it, to sow into that. It's good soil. Um, we as a church are doing that out of our tithe as well. We, we want to make the gospel go around the world, and um, there's a sermon I saw there called The Transfer of Wealth from 2002. I thought, I want to listen to this for me. So I was listening to it, enjoying it, and I've been avoiding teaching on money because people think money is about trying to pay a budget. Trust me, God has paid this budget without your money, okay? We are fully paid up on the rent. By the way, we're gonna move into being landlords in the future because it's God's plan that we're not tenants, all right? And I know God's gonna provide for that. We have faith for that, it's part of our vision. Uh, because no one's, I don't believe the church needs to be told what we're allowed to do. And I'm not against wisdom, but I will stand against being told certain people are not allowed in church buildings. Uh, redemption is for all, yes. vaccinated and unvaccinated. Yes. And I have a challenge when we start to go down that road. And as long as we're tenants, that becomes a challenge. And for Holland too, we're gonna become landlords and Germany, and we're gonna trust for that, right? It's, and it can only happen through a transfer of wealth, not through building up wealth. Yep. Hear me out, transfer is very different to savings. <laughs> transfer happens really quick. Anybody here ever worked 10 years for an EFT? No. Can you send me money? It's sent, right? So, so but hold on now, because God wants to show you his love because you feel you're not good enough, you're unqualified, and because you feel like I'll never have it, it's his love that motivates this. And you must be motivated by his love in giving. Never give without knowing he loves, okay? So we'll never manipulate. But I'm telling you the story, Holy Lord, stop the clock, amen, okay. I'm just watching time fly. So I wanted to listen to a sermon about the transfer of wealth because I see it in Isaiah 60. Now, I, I saw it there, but I've been, I've been meditating on this. Now, I didn't wanna preach to you about money today, okay? I really didn't, all right? But I believe this is a divine assignment. That's why I'm gonna preach it with faith, supernatural faith, all right? Here's the thing. From 2002, halfway through the sermon, Pastor Prince goes, Right, now let's go to a end time, last days prophecy on the church about a divine transfer of wealth. And he goes to Isaiah chapter 60. Now that sermon's so old, there's no sermon notes on it. I didn't know it had Isaiah chapter 60 in it. And the Holy Spirit's like, I've been putting this on your heart and you don't wanna listen because you're scared people are going to get thinking you're preaching about money. No, I want to preach to you because God wants you to flow in divine favor because practical glory does not speak of I'm broke, but I'm secure in salvation. The world is going to see the church flourish above. Now you are the church above the darkness and the thick darkness. Practically. That's why kings approach you because kings aren't interested in your God revelation, they're interested in your practical thriving and then they approach you. I saw a 20 something year old young, slightly chubbyish gentleman in America sitting before government in an inquest 
about what he does, not because they do that for everyone, because three years ago, he came up with an idea to create a, whatever those coins are, digital coin trading platform, and in three years, he has already amassed a wealth of over $30 billion in three years. And the government are coming to him because they're going, if he continues on this trajectory, in theory, he has more money than us. That's a transfer of wealth, everybody. I have no idea of what his spiritual standing is. I am telling you that the kings coming to you are because you are practically thriving. Your boss does not come to you when you submit a proposal that loses the company all its money. He comes to you when what you're touching is thriving. So let me say this again. God has his love for you and his promises over you behind this promise. And I have to tell you, I believe people who receive this, I believe are going to see something the world will say that can only be God. That can only be God. Now, if it is God, something has to be removed, right? And that is what we call self-effort. Because the blessing of God does not come like a curse. The blessing of God comes without burden. Now, burden is when you have to work very, 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 very hard. I'm not talking about having fruit. I'm not talking about pastors giving me permission to go sit for the rest of the year and do nothing. However, your mindset has to be, I'm not here to work hard, I'm here to be spiritually led in what I do. It has to be of the spirit. Not if I don't work so, 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 so hard, it will not yield any fruit. When you look at, they call it a beast of burden because they place the burden on it to pull the plow. The plow gets pulled because the beast goes through the pressure of the burden. But the blessing of God gives us the fruit without having to be the beast of the burden. Because why Jesus, our heavenly ox, right, has borne the burden for us. The greatest revelation of giving is born out of recognizing Jesus died for you. In your place, rose again and reigns right now. He is not in heaven suffering. He is reigning. So when we function in this flow, it looks like you reign. It looks like you're over things. It looks like you've been given, it's like, it's like you're in, it looks like leadership, can I say that? Okay? Please don't tell me it's not possible. How many of you knew these names years ago? Zuckerberg, not many. Musk, not many, right? That dude who I don't even know his name, he's worth 35, 30 billion dollars in three years. Go Google it, it's happening right now. The Senate are panicking because he's all of a sudden the guy behind all the trading of the coins. Whatever, coin, that digital, not real, whatever. And I'm not mocking it, I'm telling you, we are seeing transfers of wealth in the world. It's happening, but it's meant to be for us. It's meant to be on you. That's part of why Jesus died. We're gonna look at that today. So, Galatians chapter four. Verses one. Now I say that the heir, 
as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave. Though he is, sorry, go back, I'm reading from the screen on my Bible. Though he is a master of all, next verse, but is under guardians and stewards until the appointed time of the father. But so, even so, we were children, were in bondage. Under the elements of the world. So we were in bondage, attached to the elements, the natural environment of the earth. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts that cry out, Daddy God. So, Abba Father means Daddy God, meaning you're no longer approaching God going most holy, most righteous God. I'm a sinful sinner. You approach him going, I'm your son. I'm your heir. I'm in your family. I am in covenant, blood covenant with you, right? Therefore, you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir. An heir gets what? An inheritance. You're an heir to a fortune. We should be paying attention to this, right? But then, indeed, you did not know God, right? When you did not go, know God, you served those by which nature are not God. So you served other things as if they were God, but they are not God. Jesus speaks of worship and he says, you worship on earth mammon. You worship the acquisition of natural things, but it's the worst God. It's not God, but we treat it as God because we see it as our source. We see it as what defines us. We recognize success as how much of it you have, all right? But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly natural things to which you desire again to be in bondage? So, you can be a son, meaning a child of God. Ladies, it's just the language because inheritance was always passed down to the sons at the time of writing this, okay? So you're an heir, okay? Ladies, you can flourish financially in the same promise, amen? We do not subscribe to that, neither does scripture, okay? You flourish, in fact, amen. I don't wanna go down that today, don't get to sidetracked, right? You know where we stand as a church, okay? But look at it. When you pursue those things, you remove yourself from being an heir and you position yourself as a slave and you chase the things that pull you into bondage. I have to tell you right now, I guarantee you, I guarantee you when you think of your finances and your circumstances and all that is against you right now, you feel like you're in a prison cell. The consequences of COVID cell, fuel, is going through the roof because of COVID. Electricity, because of COVID. Shipping, because of COVID. Bread, because of COVID. Recession, because of COVID. You, you're like, I'm in a prison cell, and the more I pursue things, the harder and the further they feel from me, right? God is saying to you today, you're not walking as an heir. As an heir, God wants you to walk as an inheritor. It means you're in, you inherit, it means through death, you are enriched. Yes. Now, you don't have to die to be enriched. Yes. Hmm. It's interesting how many people who pursue wealth build it up. And when they die, it's like the kids get to go, I get to enjoy what my dad killed himself to achieve. <laughs> huh? None of us want to be Steve Jobs, who died young, killing himself to build Apple. 
They want to be his kids. You don't even know their names. And they're pretty well off. I'm, I'm not meaning that spiritually. I'm just saying practically. Say, I don't want to be the guy who killed himself to make the money. I want to be the guy who inherits the money that he killed himself to make the money. That's blessed. That's blessed. Come on. Now, now here's the thing. It's through Jesus. So here's the thing. It speaks in Galatians chapter three, which is the preface to chapter four. They are tied together because in verse four, verses one, it's very interesting. It literally says, now I say, he's continuing talking. And he starts off chapter three by saying, oh foolish Galatians, verse one, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. Why are you so deceived? You got to see he died for you. So what is the deception he's talking about? This I wanna learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? In other words, did you get what God gave you as an inheritance through your effort or through believing in his sacrifice? That's what faith is. Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit, meaning being born again, and you are now trying to be made perfect by the flesh. You are trying to become what God has ordained on you through self-effort. Have you suffered so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you works miracles among you. Does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham, meaning only through faith do you possess the blessing of Abraham. We're going somewhere today in 15 minutes. So in this promise of don't be a slave, be a son, he, prior to that confrontation, comes at it from a story that the Jewish people are to know. Why is he saying this to the Galatia church? Because they are trying to fulfill the promises of God through the works of the law. They return to trying to fulfill the law in their own work, not receiving that Christ came to fulfill the law for them to walk in the blessing of those who have fulfilled the law. The law is not unholy, but when we try in our own ability, we fall short. And to stay holy, the law cannot bend nor break. So we have to receive it in its fulfillment, not receive it in the request that we fulfill it. So it's on our side in Christ, okay? Therefore know that only those who are the sons will receive this. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, to Abraham, the gospel was preached. We'll go there in Genesis. God says to Abraham, look outside at the stars. Abraham was a Chaldean. The Chaldean tribe invented star signs. They studied the stars. There are 12 constellations. Some of you are gonna pretend you don't know what they are starting with Virgo, ending with Leo, virgin birth, scales of justice, scorpion with the sting of death. As you start to look at it, you see Abraham knew those signs. God says, look at them, what do you see? He sees the birth of a virgin. He sees the settling of justice, the conquering of the scorpion by the archer, the two fish, meaning Jew and Gentile being held by the sacrificial animal, yes. the reigning of the, ra the ram in its sacrifice, finishing up in the line of the tribe of Judah, Christ in heaven reigning as king. He saw the gospel preached. The same gospel you hear today, Abraham heard. And what was his response? He believes. Not by his works, but by belief. And in that belief, what was the result? In you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Not that you are blessed, but that you do walk in such abundance. It blesses others. 
We walk in an abundance that blesses nations. Not your, your cousin will be blessed. God speaks in abundance. Now, I'm speaking from scripture, everyone. Hear me. This is God's love for you today. He wants you to feel loved. You know, we just had Valentine's. How many of you told your loved one, I love you and gave nothing? Think about it for a moment. What would you say? You don't love me, you don't show it. God wants to show you his love this year and show others what it is to know the Lord. Practically, right? So then he goes on to say, so then those who are of faith, verse nine, are blessed with believing what Abraham believed. For as many are of the works of the, law, of the law are under the curse. For it is written, right? And it goes on to speak about the law. If you don't do it, you're cursed, right? So here's the thing. When Adam sinned, right, what happened? The earth became cursed because he gave his place to the devil. God gave him dominion, and when he chose to believe the devil over God, he gave the devil his place, right? We're gonna teach on Job this year because you're gonna recognize we've had missed teachings on Job, and, and, and you will never ever walk under that, but you can see the principles from Job's life. When Job says, though you, though you slay me, I, I, I will still bless you, I will still sing praises. God says at the end of Job, you spoke ill of me. And the reason why the devil could stand before God was because prior to Christ, it says the heavens were not cleansed because Adam had a place before God and Adam gave that place to the devil. So the devil could stand before God in Adam's place. But the Bible tells us in Hebrews, Jesus having cleansed the heavenlies with his blood once and for all, meaning the devil can never petition God against you again. That's why it says in Romans, no angelic being nor demonic being can separate us in Christ from the love. And that love speaks of the flow. All right, so I'm getting, okay. So Jesus's work is super supernatural. We can see the principles in this. But do you see how Paul is likening the blessing of Abraham as being the antithesis opposite to being under the curse of the law? The law does not curse you, it declares you cursed because you are unable to fulfill it, right? So in Malachi chapter three, verses eight through 12, let me give you a finished work picture of this. Because when you see a finished work picture of this, you will not be in fear, you will be supernaturally in faith. Because it's not that God curses you, it is that the world is under a curse. Darkness and thick darkness. If you walk past the casino and you see people gambling everything they have away, their intention of provision is true, but the mechanism is cursed. The house is set against you. The odds are against you. Do you get what I'm trying to say? You're like, don't go in there because that's not a good plan. It's a cursed, that's a cursed mechanism for favor, for blessing. Verse eight, will a man rob God? You have robbed me, but you say, in what have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse. Now, doesn't God doesn't say, I curse you. He's saying, when you function in your own ability, you function from a curse. For you have robbed me. Now, you haven't robbed God of money. You've robbed God of his desire to supernaturally bless you, according to Abraham. Even this whole nation. Look at this. Bring all the tithes into, so, into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Now test me in this and see if I would not open the windows of heaven, pour it out on you, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Huh. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in your field. God says, when you grasp this principle, you shift from being under the curse to being under divine blessing. Now, do you know that Paul mentions in Galatians the blessing of Abraham? When we go to the blessing of Abraham around the righteous by faith, we see that exchange in Genesis 14 verses 
17 and onwards, Abraham is now approached by a king. Look at the, the Gentiles coming to you, right? Because he has just had huge success, right? And the king comes to meet him and says to him, listen, give me the stuff and I'll give you the people. Here's the deal. The devil's after people. And so is God. Do you know when Jesus says, if you are faithful with little, I will make you ruler over much? The Greek there is, if you are faithful with money, which is little, I will make you ruler over much, which is people. Okay? God wants to use this principle to raise you into leadership in the land practically. Leadership in your business practically. Because when you lead and you look to Jesus, others will see your testimony and glory and pursue your savior, not you. Amen? Amen? Oh, come on, guys. Let's speak practically here. If you're the richest person in this country, do you think you have the cell phone of the president? Uh-huh. They'll come talk to you all the time. If you're the biggest taxpayer, they wanna know your opinion on policy here. Right? And look at this. Then Melchizedek comes. The king of Salem, Melchizedek, king of righteousness, Salem, peace. Who's this? Jesus. We know in Hebrews, I'll go there now in a little while, Paul says that we are, that Melchizedek is Christ. He likens Melchizedek to Christ. Melchizedek had no death. We have no record of his life on earth. It's an appearance of a high priest. It says Jesus functions in the high priest of Melchizedek. In scripture, it tells us this is how Jesus functions in his ministry. How do we know this? The king of righteousness and peace brings out what? Bread and wine. Bread and wine. Now in Hebrews chapter nine, we don't have time to go there. It tells us that bread and wine of the Melchizedek covenant testifies witnesses, witnesses that Jesus died, that he died, his death for us. It says he died, he died, he died. His body was broken for your sickness. His blood was shed for your sin. He died for you, he died for you, he died for you, right? And so this is what Jesus comes with, his ministry unto us, right? And as we receive of that, what does he do? He blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. So God declares of Abraham, you are so blessed. Do you know how powerful the blessing of Abraham is? Can I speak to you about it? Abraham goes into Egypt with Sarah. She's a picture of grace, right? In both Abraham and Sarah's lives, when their name was changed, they walked in the favor of God. And He, which is the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, means the hand of God, the grace of God. A He, a Ha, was added. Abram became Abra, Ham, and Sarai became Sarah. Grace was added, right? That is the covenant we have through God, through Christ with God, right? So we walk in that covenant, grace. I didn't earn it, he earned it for me. I'm not the sacrifice, he was the sacrifice for me. Now look at this, he goes into Egypt and the king sees his absolutely gorgeous wife and says, who's that? And Abraham realizes, I'm in the king's land, this is not a good idea, I should try and win his favor. And he lies and says, she's not my wife, she's my sister. And the king says, great, I'll take her for my bedroom. I don't know what Abraham prayed after that, but I'm pretty sure it was God. I'm in a mess, help me out. The king goes to sleep prior to doing anything to Sarah, right? Sarah says nothing, by the way. She's not like petitioning, you know what I mean? It's not recorded there. And the king has a dream. God goes to him and says, how dare you touch my prophet's wife? If you don't redeem this situation, I'll have you. God doesn't say, how dare you 
come against the liar who didn't tell you the truth. God doesn't even recognize Abraham's mistake in the situation. The king wakes up and says to Abraham, I've taken your wife, not why didn't you tell me she was your wife? I apologize for that. God came to me and told me I have to redeem the situation. I give you back your wife untouched and I release you with land, cattle and wealth from me. It's too good to be true. This all happened before the 10 commandments were given. Under grace, the nation of Israel complained the whole way out of Egypt into and across the Jordan the whole time until the 10 commandments were given. They complained and every time they complained, God does a miracle. Here we are to die. Oh, the ocean parts, the, the, the sea parts. Oh, here we are to die of thirst. Oh, water out of a rock. Every time they complain, we're hungry. Food from heaven. It's a covenant of grace that Abraham was under, right? Until the law was given where they said to God, all that we need to do to earn righteousness, we will keep. Before they even heard the 10 commandments, by the way. And what was the first commandment? Only worship God. What was the first thing they do? Built a golden calf. When it's all about you, you will not be able to do it at all. In fact, you will do the opposite. And that's under a curse. When you try to do it in your own strength, Paul says, I literally feel cursed in Romans chapter seven because everything I wanna do, I don't do. Everything I don't do, I shouldn't do. I do like a professional. I practice it. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? So that's the revelation. I'm in Christ, shift it from your effort to his effort, right? What does Abraham respond to that blessing with? A tithe. In verse 20, as he receives the blessing, Abraham responds to Melchizedek with a tithe. Now we have the communion and we have the tithe, right? And it's very interesting. In chapter 15, verses one, it says this right, after these things, meaning after Abraham receives communion from Melchizedek and responds with a tithe, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, vision month, saying, do not be afraid, I am your shield and I'm your exceedingly great reward. That language there for shield is I am your divine protection. And that word there for reward is exceedingly great monthly salary. So we have our divine protection in communion and our tithe is our exceedingly great monthly salary. After these things, these were the promises. Now it says in Hebrews chapter nine, this testifies Jesus died. It tells everyone around you, Jesus died. That's what it's about. Jesus died, his body was given, his blood was shed. In Hebrews chapter seven, verses seven through nine, Hebrews chapter seven, verses seven through nine, look at what it tells us. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Now this is referring back to Abraham and Melchizedek. And it is telling us that Abraham blessed Melchizedek. Meaning, when Abraham has the fruit of his loins naturally, which is where the earthly priesthood came from, out of Abraham's loins came the earthly priesthood of the earthly temple of the Jewish faith, right? Now Paul is, well, we believe it's Paul. The writer of Hebrews is trying to show the Jews because Hebrews is to the Hebrews. <laughs> Very obvious. Romans, Romans, Galatians. Now, it's not written to us, it's written for us. To the Jews, for us. He's trying to show Jesus is Melchizedek. He says, the lesser blesses the greater. Who blessed whom? Abraham blessed Melchizedek with his tithe. So he is declaring to Melchizedek, you are greater than I. So the writer of Hebrews is trying to say, Jesus is greater than natural priesthood, where currently there are people worshiping, right? So he said in chapter nine, the body and the blood testifies that Jesus died. It is the obvious declaration he is our sacrificial animal. But look at this, it says here, here, right now, mortal men receive tithes because they receive tithes in the Jewish church, okay? Here, mortal men receive tithes, but there, he receives them so that it witnesses he lives. Even Levi who receives tithes paid them through Abraham 
so to speak, to Melchizedek, saying when we tithe to Jesus in his church, it testifies, not just to you, it declares your God is alive. Your God is alive, alive, alive. Meaning, why does it matter that Jesus is alive? Because Jesus is working for you. He is functioning in a priesthood for you. Do you know when they gave their offering to the priest and he declared it blessed and he offered it unto the Lord, they walked in blessing, those who offered it. Jesus receives your tithes in heaven. Rand, euro, dollar, coin, whatever. It gets there, gets offered to God, perfect and pleasing. And that favor comes here for now, for this place. Now, how many of you know when Jesus walked on the earth, we're gonna feed 20,000 people. Okay, there's a problem, Christ. We're up on the mountain. Now, I've been there. It is nowhere near a restaurant. It is up on a mountain. We like, it would be like Jesus is at the top of Table Mountain with 20,000 people, and they're hungry. What are you gonna do? It's gonna take a while to get food up there for 20,000 people. Jesus says, what's here? There. Great. A few loaves and fish. Give it to me. Okay. What does he do? Give it to you. What does he do? Blesses it. He says, now hand it out. Okay. I was expecting it to grow before we handed it out. But you know what would have happened? People would have said, oh, this isn't a miracle because they had the food delivered. How many of you know, if you like looked outside of a building today and you saw a big mound of food, you would think someone delivered it when you weren't looking. The miracle was to see it multiply as it's sown, as it's given, and feed, and feed, and feed, and feed. If I was Peter, I would have said to the first person, take a little bit. Don't be greedy. We would need faith if Joel, our child, was the first person to get food, everybody. You should see him, right? It's through the cross that we are blessed. Do you know that in Genesis 48, we see an incredible illustration, verses 12 through 16, Jacob is about to bless his two sons and he's about to declare blessing. Now, the way inheritance is passed on is the eldest gets a double portion to the youngest, right? And literally, Joseph brings his two sons before his dad, Jacob, buys his faith, verse 13, he buys his faith. And look at what happened. Ephraim, with his right hand, towards Israel, left hand, and Manasseh with his left hand towards Israel being Jacob's right hand. And he brought them near him. So Joseph prepares them, right, in the order that is effective and right. So eldest gets the double portion out of the right hand and the, and the youngest gets the single portion. Then Israel, meaning Jacob, because his name was changed, remember, stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, the wrong one who was the younger. <laughs> and his left hand on Manasseh's head, right? Even though he knowingly knows this is the firstborn, right? And then he blesses them. <laughs> and Joseph says, what are you doing? You're giving the double portion to the wrong son, right? And in this exchange, we know that Jacob says, no, this is the Holy Spirit's doing. Now, I ask you, is this a picture of something? Jesus was due the double portion. <laughs> but God knew a greater plan. He takes your place. He receives your inheritance, which was death because of sin. And he exchanges with you the double portion of blessing and life. Through the cross, you are blessed. We don't tithe to get money. We, we, we respond to the work of Jesus. Oh, foolish Galatians, it was witnessed that Jesus died. It, you know he's alive now. We give because we recognize our God wants to do supernatural things over us. That promise in Isaiah 60, lift up your eyes all around 
and see, look again what I'm gonna do for you. And kings and the wealth of the Gentiles shall be drawn unto you. It's coming your way. There is divine favor that the world recognizes this year for us to walk in. It's always a promise for us, but this is a year I believe it's gonna be accelerated like never before, right? Now look at this, why a tenth? <laughs> why is God interested in the tithe, which is a tenth, and then offerings, which is when you are supernaturally led to sow? Myself and Tara, we tithe, and, and every so often God will lay on our hearts to sow, okay? It's so interesting, why a tenth? Well, in the same passage of scripture, it's interesting that in Genesis chapter 45, what happens? Jacob, who was Israel, thought his son Joseph was dead. He sent his sons into Egypt, right? They're in there, they're trying to survive. They have, their, their land is faltering because the world is in famine. At the time of Joseph's reign, the world is in famine, right? <laughs> Let's pull it up, Genesis chapter 45. Verses 20, right? Do we have it there? Awesome. Do not be concerned about your goods. For the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. This is what Joseph is saying to tell Jacob. Don't be worried. The best of Egypt, the world, the best of the world is actually yours. So Joseph wants to get a message to Jacob. Jacob, stop stressing about famine because we know Joseph is a picture of Jesus in the story, right? We, we'll teach on that another time. And Jesus wants to get a message to say, I am alive. Why did the brothers go, right? To try and survive. They needed to get bread. There was no grain in the land. They went to just survive. But the message from Joseph was, tell dad I'm alive, I'm not dead. Dad already believed Joseph was dead. And now he was just trying to survive and beg and literally go, how do we just eat? And the message was, I'm alive. What was the practical illustration Joseph sent? Then the sons of Israel did, and Joseph gave them carts according to the command of Pharaoh, and he gave them provision for the journey. He gave all of them each man changes of garments, but to Benjamin, we have a whole thing on Benjamin generation, we'll teach it again to you, it's the generation of grace. When Joseph says, when Benjamin stands before me, I will release Simeon who was in captivity. Simeon meaning hearing, and Benjamin's brothers were, they were all Jews, but Benjamin and Joseph shared the same mother. And in the story of Abraham, he has Hagar and he has Sarah. Hagar is the work of the law by the flesh, trying to achieve the promise that God had placed on Abraham by his works. And Sarah has received the promise by grace and faith, right? Both had the father of faith, Abraham. They both had a faith mechanism. But the question is, which mother are you from? Grace or works? And, the, and what was posed to Abraham was cast them out because they bully them. You'll always find people of works want to bully people of grace, right? They have, they have a deep hatred for us anyways. But the other brothers were not of the same mother. Now we could say we at the moment don't have the same mother as the Jews. Now God's plan is to have the Jews come to faith in Christ. And it's interesting that he says, until Benjamin stands before me, and Benjamin means grace, five changes of garments, 300 pieces of silver, we have a whole take. When the generation of grace stands before Joseph, our heavenly Jesus, hearing will be released to the Jews of the gospel. Right, we have a whole thing around this, but look at this. He sent his father these practical things to say, I'm alive and the land is yours. 10 donkeys loaded with good things of Egypt and 10 female donkeys loaded with bread. 10 represents all the wealth of the world. In James, it says there are 10 laws under the law, but if you break one, you break them all. 10, when God wants to speak of all practically, he uses the number 10, a 10th in God's eyes is you give all. Now it's on your side. 
He doesn't need you to give 90% to say you give all and live off 10. He says, give a tenth and you declare, my God is alive. And in God's eyes, He blesses you as if you gave all. It is a testimony that He lives. It testified Joseph is alive to everybody, not just Jacob, everyone around Jacob went, where did this grain and money come from? My son, Joseph is alive and he is reigning in the land of Egypt. And he tells me, it's all mine. It's about you enjoying favor. It is attached in Isaiah 60 to joy. It says joy is coming your way and the wealth of the sea and the Gentiles, practically meaning it just comes your way. It comes your way. You didn't strategize it, you didn't plan for it, you didn't work for it. Now, you might be given a strategy by God, but that's a given strategy. But it's not you listening to 57 hours of a life coach. It's not you diving into some strategy of some formula of some guy trying to figure out how am I gonna get wealth? because even your friends would say you work for it. I believe there are going to be businesses born, ideas born, and I'm not saying leave your business, I'm saying even in your business you can be led, but trust God for divine supernatural favor. Trust God for divine favor. Why? Because He loves you, and He doesn't want you getting sick and not sleeping at night over provision. He does not want you stressing about who's gonna feed the kids, who's gonna take care of your family. He wants you to walk in a flow and a favor, to rule and reign as an heir, to testify that God's glory is shining on you. Practically, kings and people and nations come and say, what is this glory on you? I believe it's a year of divine transfer of wealth through us applying a finished work to our finances. So how does it move? It's interesting. It says literally, when you tithe from love, remember Jesus says from love, not because you're scared, not because I'm manipulating. You are welcome not to do it. When you do it from love, what it does is it moves from placing you under the earth's darkness and it shifts us into what? functioning from the finished work and the grace of God and it declares it in his hands. Now he works for your provision. Now he works. You can rest knowing he is working. And when God works, it's not crumbs, ladies and gentlemen. When God pulls a plow, it's not one apple in your field. I'm preaching this that Everyone who's watching this, South Africa, Netherlands, Hungary, Germany, anywhere else in the world, you will walk in divine financial favor as you follow and flow with the Holy Spirit this year. Supernatural increase. Increase over your practical things. Why? Because that is a testimony in this time. Jesus is alive and working. That we are not them under darkness, functioning from thick darkness. We have an arise and shine for our light has come. Father God, I declare today, people receive it. Father, I declare you birth in this church a mighty move of the miraculous for your glory that we in being supernaturally blessed will walk in blessing others supernaturally that we will be a testimony of the grace and the glory of God and we will function in an abundance in order to be a blessing in a time, to bring glory to Jesus and to see people receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you that ideas are birthed. Father, that there is a transfer this year divinely into your people's hands. Father, we thank you that we are going to be used mightily of God to reach the Jews with the gospel this year. Practically, that there will be finance that follows it. That as we as a church sow, Father, you're gonna give us seed to sow supernaturally, to be landowners, 
to build churches in Israel practically too. We've just had our buildings revoked from our works in Israel because we are tenants. We're gonna trust God to own buildings in the most expensive cities in the world so that the gospel can be preached. This is all for a testimony of what God is gonna do. Arise and shine, our light has come. And we choose to see again that this situation in the earth is an opportunity, not an obstacle. It is the best time in the world to become a supernatural sower is in the heart and the midst of famine. We choose to let Jesus be our provider. I release rest, ease. We remove striving and the stress and the burdens of financial provision off of people's shoulders. I pray that God works in our sleep, gives us dreams, brings us financial favor and the Holy Spirit guides and orders our steps that we do not chase after schemes but we receive supernaturally the strategy of heaven for our lives. In Jesus' name, we receive that. Amen, 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 amen. We're gonna take now time for people who don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I've spoken all about what Jesus wants to do in your life and the favor He wants you to flow in. But until you are removed from living as a sinner, trying to earn your salvation, until you shift from being a slave in your sin to being a son and daughter of God by believing in Jesus, you can't function in this. God has brought you here today, maybe to hear about money, but actually He's after your rest and your peace. You know, the Bible says where your treasure is, your heart is. He wants your heart to be settled. And that is all about believing in Jesus as your savior. So wherever you're watching, if you're in this room or you're watching online, God has your salvation at hand. He wants you to remove all the burden and the bondage that sin brings into your life and receive the freedom and the liberty that comes with believing in Jesus' death. Right now, right here, I'm not asking you about church attendance, I'm asking you, have you ever prayed a prayer to confess Christ your Lord and Savior? If you've never prayed that prayer, pray with us today and receive salvation. Receive, notice that Abraham's response was to receiving the bread and the wine, the sacrifice of Jesus for his sin. Receive that today, pray this prayer with us and your life is not saved for a moment and your life is not saved until the next sin, but your life is saved for eternity. You are righteous, perfect and pleasing. You are here by a divine appointment, watching this by a divine appointment to walk in the freedom of salvation today. Pray this prayer with us right here, right now. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me by your blood that was shed and your body that was broken. All my sin, past, present, and future has been washed away. Today I declare, you are my Lord. You are my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen, amen. Let's give a hand to all the people that prayed that for the first time. Now, if you are in our church building and you've prayed that prayer for the first time, as you leave the foyers, you'll see a new believers table. We wanna give you a gift and we wanna tell you more about the prayer that you just prayed. If you're in one of our services watching this, we wanna bless you. After the service, come and tell us, I prayed that prayer for the first time. We wanna celebrate with you and give you a gift from us. If you're watching online, comment below or email the email address on the screen telling us you prayed that prayer for the first time. We wanna send you gifts all about Jesus and celebrate with you what God has done in your life today. Amen. We're gonna receive communion together right now. We're gonna come to our heavenly Melchizedek. Get some bread, some juice wherever you are. If you're watching online, you can push pause, go get the elements. You just need bread and and juice and you can use a crack, you can use anything to be the body and the blood of Jesus. You're welcome to stand, remain seated, whatever's more comfortable for you. But in this place right now, we're gonna receive that blessing. We're gonna receive that blessing that says we are blessed. It's a double promise of blessing. When Melchizedek blesses Abraham after he receives the bread and the wine, he blesses him upon blesses him upon blesses him. The body of Jesus, this bread, took all our 
sickness. All our earthly weakness in our bodies. Maybe you fear sickness. Maybe you have a mental sickness. Maybe you have an oppression, a depression. His body was broken for you. You know, when Jesus took your place, he sweated blood. And people will tell you, doctors will tell you, that comes at the greatest stress. His blood was also for your stress. So we receive that he was broken for us, for you, for your body, for your sickness, for your health. So as we take this bread, we say the body of Jesus, broken for me, declares me healed and whole. I receive healing by the suffering of Jesus. Break it and eat it. Thank you, Jesus. This juice, his blood was shed. We are no longer in a covenant that requires us to earn. It is a covenant that is earned for us. Jesus came to earth and shed his blood for every one of your sins, past, present, and future. People say, what about my future sin, pastor? Well, how many of your sins were in the future when Jesus died at the cross? All of them. It's an eternal security. You are secure in salvation today. You are secure as pleasing to God. You are secure as precious to God. We receive that today. Thank you, Jesus. Let it be sealed within us in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Thanks so much for tuning in. I pray that today's word blessed and touched you. Let us know if you experienced something, if something happened on the inside. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to hear the testimony of how God used us to impact you. Until we see you again, stay safe, be blessed, and know that grace is greater than any obstacle you face. From us at Redemption Church, have an incredible day.